In the early morning hours of December 12, 1988, what seemed to be another ordinary evening in Central Traffic Division turned out to be one that would change the Los Angeles Police Department forever. 28-year-old police officer Vincent Drake came to work that night with the same cautious excitement that any new officer would have. It was his second day. He engaged in a conversation with 28-year-old police officer Derek Connor in the locker room as they prepared for morning watch roll call. Yeah, I work with him Yeah, he's good. You know, he's good tactically. You know, he knows what he's doing. 25-year-old police officer David Hoffmeyer and 26-year-old police officer Manuel Gutierrez were also preparing to start their watch. In roll call, all eyes focus on the watch commander. As part of the daily routine, the rotator was read. Assignments were given. Detectives, they'll be working on a Code 37 vehicle task force. So listen up to your radio and back them. It was all so normal. As the morning went on, Officers Gutierrez and Connor were on patrol downtown. Officers Drake and Hoffmeyer were just about to return to Central Station. Then, at 3.55 in the morning... A broadcast from an undercover unit. Officers Gutierrez and Connor immediately responded, as did Officers Hoffmeyer and Drake. Officers Gutierrez and Connor were traveling eastbound on 5th Street, a one-way westbound street. Both vehicles entered the intersection on 5th and Wall. Yeah. The force of the impact sent Officer Gutierrez and Connor's vehicle into a light pole. One officer was thrown from the car, the other partially ejected. Officer Hoffmeyer and Drake's vehicle landed in a nearby construction ditch, 20 feet deep. This traffic collision, which marks the worst in LAPD's history, will forever be known as Fifth and Wall. I remember seeing the site, and it was, it was a very gruesome site, and uh, it's something that stayed with me for a long time. Captain Michael Orb was one of the first officers to arrive on scene. We saw what, what looked like a leg uh, out of the debris field where the construction site was. One of the badges, one of the officer's badges, I remember, was about a block from the traffic accident scene. Sergeant Daniel Putz was one of the first officers to respond. There was a pair of uniform boots, and the boots were laced up, and they were still at the car. Um, and I remember seeing them and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, is there feet in these things? But um, the impact from the crash had knocked Derek Connor right out of his uniform boots that were laced up. As people were rolling up, no one could believe it. This can't be real, this can't be happening. This can't be real. Um, but it was real. It was very devastating. I rolled up to that scene. Um, I felt like someone had punched me in the stomach. Uh, when I saw my, my friends and my fellow officers in uniform, I saw their bodies at the scene. Um, I mean, it hurt. It hurt bad. Hey, lady, uh, we need a 30, 30 minute, uh, fifth and, uh, well, we've got uh, two cars in fire. Z-99, we're going to need a, a sergeant. We've got a first car involved in an accident. I'm going to foster needs help. Fifth and wall, fifth and wall. Officer trapped in the vehicle at TA. We were uh, on Wall Street heading northbound. Wall Street. Vincent Drake, the only officer to survive the crash. We were right by the, the signal, right by the station on the side of the street. 
And at that time, when we got the call, I figured that we were possibly going to punch it. And before then, we were only going maybe about 10, maybe 5 to 10 miles an hour, very, very slow. And, you know, back then when you, we were patrolling, and it was even when I came out and did my ride along, uh, most officers did not wear their safety belts at slower speeds, you know. And at that point, I just figured that we were getting ready to hit it. So I just snapped my uh, safety belt on. The light was green. And I just rec I was remember recording in my log the call and thought we were going to hit it. And then the next thing I know, I was waking up. Chaos and confusion surrounded the smoky wreckage of both cars. It's a rush because it's LAPD and they're like our brothers and sisters. Los Angeles Fire Captain Glenn Ames. And we came around a corner and it almost looked like a disaster zone in the intersection. When I saw the Manny's black and white up against a pole there in the intersection and it had major damage. So I knew right then that it was a, a traffic accident. But we didn't know what happened or who he'd hit or uh, if it was a solo uh, vehicle accident. We weren't sure when we rolled up. And as we came off the rig, someone's pointing down in a hole, which we couldn't see it. And there's a police car down in a trench, which was the footing for the new LA mission. I remember waking up and it was pitch black in the ditch. And uh, I, I was trying to climb out of the car and I was yelling for help. When Vincent Drake climbed out of the car, he was very slow. Um, I remember it just like, like he was in slow motion coming up out of the car. And uh, I just always remember that. I mean, it was almost like a ghost or something. As Officer Drake was rushed to the hospital, crews worked furiously to extricate his partner, Officer Hoffmeyer. The car was on its side and uh, he was also pinned between the, the door and the foot pedal. So um, I, uh, in turn, held uh, the apparatus operator at the time by his feet as he was able to get down and maneuver his way down over to the passenger side of the vehicle and then uh, work his extremities free from the entanglement. At the same time, another team was working on the other patrol vehicle. The debris is still shooting up in the air, um, uh, cars smoking, and uh, as we get closer to the car, uh, the doors are sprung and we see uh, an officer laying out partially in, partially out of, the, out of the car. And his leg is pinned in at the shotgun rack uh, inside the car. Uh, the car is, uh, is pretty much obliterated. It's in pieces. It looks like it's bent uh, at the center of the vehicle. Uh, and so my partner and I, uh, we, we saw that the officer, who we couldn't even recognize at the time, uh, was in serious, uh, very serious condition. I went inside the police vehicle, uh, was able to unlace his boot so we could get him out of the car. I knew that uh, Manny was working with a partner that night, and I believed it was Derek, and uh, he wasn't anywhere to be seen um, near the car and we uh, found his body up under some plywood. That officer was Derek Connor. It was too late to save him. Meanwhile, Officer Drake slowly pieced together what happened. I was asking the officer what hit us, who hit us, and he finally told me that a, another black and white had collided with us. And so I asked him, I said, well, how's my partner? And he didn't say anything. I said, well, how are the other officers? I said, who were the other officers? And he said, well, Gutierrez. And I didn't know who Gutierrez was at the time. And then he said, um, Derek and Connor. And I said, well, how are they? And he just shook his head like, you know, they didn't make it. And at that point, it just kind of, it kind of hit me. The rescue effort soon turned into recovery. Responders worked frantically for hours. In the end, David Hoffmeyer and Derek Connor were removed. Both died of massive head injuries at the scene. Doctors tried to save Manuel Gutierrez, but he later died. Officer Drake's mother, Betty Drake, vividly recalls being told what happened. I saw the black and white car 
and it had parked in front of my house. And I saw him slowly walk up my stairs. And I really began to pray. I said, dear God, please spare my son. Please let him be okay. Investigators concluded Officer Drake survived because he was the only officer in the crash who was wearing a seatbelt. I went through a guilt thing. Well, why, you know, why am I here and the other officers didn't make it? And, and especially with Derek because I had a personal relationship, you know, with him. So it was kind of, it was kind of, um, that was kind of difficult. Officer Hoffmeyer's father shares his feelings from that day. I could tell on the, on the look of their faces that this, that it wasn't good news. Mr. Hoffmeyer has two other sons who joined the LAPD in the years following the accident. I remember I was in, uh, it was like in a, a study hall atmosphere, like in a, in a classroom, and I had, uh, I had stepped out to go use the restroom. And uh, when, I, when I came out of the bathroom, the, the principal of the high school was waiting there for me, and uh, he told me that he wanted me to come with him. And uh, initially, I thought I was in trouble, and uh, you know, I was like thinking, "Man, what did I do? You know, did I did I do something here?" I was like, you know, "I didn't 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 get in a whole lot of trouble in high school," and uh, I was like thinking to myself, "Man, what what's going on?" And so uh, he brought me into the conference room uh, at the high school, by by the uh, in the office there, and uh, my dad was there, and I thought, "Man, this is this is really weird. You know, why is what, what's what's going on?" And uh, as my dad told me that, that David had been, David had been killed in, in an accident out here in, uh, in L.A. and that he had died along with two other officers. Faye Hoffmeyer, Officer Hoffmeyer's mother, recalls the last time she saw her son. I said, Dave, the next time I see you, you're going to be a dad. And he was so excited for this baby. Bridget Perry was Officer Connor's fiance. He never got to meet their son. Six months after the accident, uh, June 23rd, 1989, is when I gave birth to our son, and who I named Derek Connor Jr. Um, that meant a lot to me, because knowing that I was going to have to raise um, a child who would never meet his father, that was important to me to at least to give him his dad's name so that he would have something, some type of connection with his father. No, I have never met my father, but when I do need to talk or I need guidance, I always visit his burial site. In addition to me being two and a half months pregnant with our child, um, Derek had a son, Darius Connor, who was almost five years old, he would have turned five in January. Normally my mom or my dad would pick me up from school. And that day, my uncle had picked me up early from school, took me back to my grandmother's house, and I seen everybody crying, and my mom pulled me to the side, explained to me at that age, I really didn't know, know what they were explaining to me. The accident at Fifth and Wall left an indelible mark on the history of the LAPD. After that crash, then Police Chief Darrell Gates ordered all members of the LAPD to wear their seatbelts, and for a time, many did. I remember seeing signs at the back of the at the station, you know, don't forget to you know buckle up. You'd see them at the back of many of the city uh, or department stations uh, that were trying to enforce it. I remember during the funeral service, Chief Gates got up and said, uh, "This incident." is gonna save other officers' lives down the road. And I never realized that I was be, would be one of those officers uh, whose life was saved. Uh, approximately three weeks later, um, as I was going to a call, a drunk driver ran a red light and T-boned my police car. Uh, it was a serious accident. They had to cut me out of the car with the jaws of life. The only reason I survived that accident was because I was wearing my seatbelt that night. 
but many officers still do not. The LAPD is trying to inspire officers to buckle up. I make sure that our officers at least understand uh, why they're wearing it. And we talk about it in roll call. You know, you know they, they do mention that it takes longer to get out of the car. And, um, you know, what happens if I get attacked when I'm sitting in the car? It's going to take me that much longer to get out. And we talk about it. We discuss it. And it comes down to you have to practice it. It's once you practice it, you know, it becomes second nature. You're able to get out of the car just as fast. I don't think it's a it's that much of a tactical issue that that a lot of guys um, make it out to be. I think yeah, sometimes it's not very comfortable to wear, and it's a you have all your equipment to get that seat belt over, and it gets in the way sometimes. Um, but I think all, a lot of it has to do just with peer pressure and the you know uh, I you know I'm invincible. You know I don't I don't need a seat belt. There is not one case that's been documented uh, in the annals of, of, of contemporary policing where officers have been placed in peril because they couldn't get their seatbelt off in time, not one. And so we have to dispel this, this notion that uh, if you put your seatbelt on, you're placing your life in danger. It's the opposite. If you don't put your seatbelt on, you're placing your life and the future of your family in danger. Your actions in that car not only affect you, but it affects people around you and can also affect your family members. Officer Drake retired from the LAPD in 2013. He values spending time with his daughter, Kaylin. I thank God for like making my dad choose to wear his seatbelt because if he did it, I don't know if he would have made it or not and I wouldn't be here this very day or this very moment. There's a greater likelihood of surviving any, any kind of collision if with your seatbelt on. And you don't want to look at it from my perspective where I've lost, you know, lost a good friend. Twenty-five years ago, at Fifth and Wall, an important part of department history occurred. Officers Hoffmeyer, Connor, and Gutierrez died at this intersection. They died as heroes. They died responding to another officer's call for help. But they didn't have to die. If they'd have been wearing their seatbelts, they would have survived. Over 900 officers have been killed nationwide since that incident occurred 25 years ago. Let's honor their memories. Let's not live through this again. Wear your seatbelts. Make sure your partner wears his or her seatbelt. Don't let these officers have died in vain.